Hi everybody, my name is Alon and today I will be presenting uh, the solution to one of our um, challenges from Blue Hat 2020. Um, so a short introduction, uh, like I said, my name is Alon. I'm an independent researcher and consultant and I've had the pleasure of working with Microsoft um, on Blue Hat's challenges uh, for the past two years. And in this presentation, we're going to talk about the Interplanetary Chat Challenge. Uh, and we're going to start with a very uh, brief overview of the challenge and then uh, maybe um, a bit of, uh, of our thought process in developing it and how one should approach a challenge like this. And then we're going to go uh, into the technical details of the actual crypto mechanisms involved and of course eventually present uh, the solution. So uh, those of you who have attended the conference uh, will have seen that the general theme was that of uh, uh, electronic freedom, uh, surveillance, privacy, uh, and we wanted to base our challenges on these concepts and themes uh, and complement these themes. Um, and for this specific challenge, we opted to go with the idea of uh, a peer-to-peer end-to-end -peer, uh, -end encrypted chat system. So most of the uh, instant messaging or chat uh, applications that you use today, uh, such as WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, even Signal, um, while they might be end-to-end uh, -end encrypted in a sense, they still require a certain degree of trust since you're basically using servers that are managed by, uh, by commercial entities. Uh, and you're relying on them to broker your messages, to generate your keys. Uh, and uh, again, unless you go into the um, details of every single one of the crypto schemes implemented in those systems, you can't really fully trust them. So the idea that we uh, wanted to go with here was that of uh, a decentralized chat system, meaning there's no single server entity that brokers the message, uh, but rather there's a peer-to-peer -peer network uh, where messages are passed from peer to peer without having to pass through a certain central entity. Uh, and to implement this, we decided to use uh, a library called libp2p or libp2peer, which is a very interesting project, um, which provides developers with building blocks to write peer-to-peer -peer applications very easily. It's essentially a peer-to-peer -peer networking stack. Uh, and it introduces a lot of uh, new concepts and ideas uh, that we're not going to go fully into in, in this presentation since uh, it does require uh, some amount of reading and studying. Um, but the gist of it is that you discover other peers by using one of the peer discovery mechanisms implemented in the stack. Uh, which usually starts off with a bootstrap mechanism, meaning you connect to an entity which tells you, um, let's say, a few peers, and uh, then um, basically derive all those, all the following peers from those initial peers. Uh, and transports are created between uh, you and other peers, uh, where those transports are end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, usually using TLS, but they're unauthenticated in the context uh, of, of this application, at least, meaning you can have your own public key, but in the context of, of this chat application, uh, keys are just randomly generated and there's no real, um, uh, no, 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 no authority dictating uh, which key belongs to which entity, um, which is uh, essentially one of the prerequisites for, for anonymity. Um, and once transports are created, data can be routed between all the peers uh, using some sort of, uh, of, of data routing mechanism. Uh, in this case, we used one of the routing mechanisms implemented in libp 2 p which is uh, called Gossip Sub. Uh, Gossip Sub is a, uh, is a pub sub network, which is implemented using a mesh, where uh, peers are basically intended to gossip about messages between one another, meaning instead of having one certain, one, one central entity, which uh, makes, sure, makes sure that everyone receives a certain message, uh, the idea is that you're supposed to reach uh, almost uh, ideal, uh, ideal coverage by just um, gossiping about certain messages that you receive or certain topics. Um, and as you can imagine, implementing a chat room over a pub sub network is um, actually pretty straightforward since you can just treat topics as chat rooms. So when you want to join, join a chat room, then you just publish to that topic and you subscribe to it uh, to receive messages on that, uh, on that chat room. 
So uh, there's no real physical uh, presence uh, with this challenge, meaning you won't see anything in the conference space. All you, your only lead is the source code, which we uh, published on the day of the conference. Uh, and uh, the initial recon steps would be just to take a look at that source code. You would see that uh, it was written in Golang, which is a fairly memory safe language. So uh, there's unlikely to be any memory corruption vulnerabilities here. Um, and that there isn't really any any server here. There is a bootstrap node that you that you connect to, uh, which is implemented using uh, Kademlia DHD. Some of you may know this from from BitTorrent, but uh, like I mentioned briefly earlier, the only role that this uh, this uh, server uh, provides is just to link you to the first few peers, and then you um, you discover the, the rest of the rest of the peers um, uh, just by gossiping about them. So messages are passed peer to peer. The server does not does not does not see any of the messages. So there's no no likelihood of there being a server side attack here either. Um, as I mentioned, chat rooms are just topics to the pub sub network. Now, by default, uh, rooms are not password protected, meaning they're public. You can see the messages in them, but there is an option to to uh, connect to a room with a password. Uh, that password is used to derive a group or a master key. Uh, which is then used to encrypt a per message message key. Uh, so let's take a closer look at this crypto scheme. So um, the way messages are encoded, they're, they're serialized as protobufs. And for plain text me messages, the protobufs are very simple. All they contain is the actual content of the message. Uh, but for encrypted protobufs, for encrypted messages, uh, the protobuf also includes an IV, an initialization vector and an encrypted message key, uh, where the, the message key that's encrypted inside that information is then supposed to be used uh, with the AES IGE block cipher, uh, which as far as we know is used only in Telegram, uh, to decrypt the content of the uh, message. So when you generate an encrypted message, you randomize a 16 byte uh, initialization vector and a 16 byte key and you encrypt the message with the 16 byte key that you randomized and you encrypt that key that message key that per message key uh, with the group or master key which uh, uh, as i said is derived from the room password um, you can see this in the code snippet below uh, that essentially whenever we send a message uh, we use the rand reader object to uh, populate to uh, 16 byte uh, buffers, the IV and the message key. And then the message key is, is encrypted by, uh, by storing it with the master key or the group key. Um, and when you take a look at the random number generator uh, used to, to randomize these bytes, you can see that it's implemented uh, using something called BHRNG or, or Blue Hat RNG. Uh, which seems to utilize elliptic curves. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of theoretical, theoretical detail uh, about elliptic curves. Um, you will hear me throwing around a lot of mathematical terms here, uh, but don't worry if you don't feel that you have the required background to, uh, to understand this, because um, uh, we're mostly going to take a look at the actual practical aspects of how this is used um, and not the actual theory of how elliptic curve crypto works. Um, so even if you don't have any mathematical background, you should be able to solve the, a challenge like this. Uh, so just to, to go over it very briefly, elliptic curves um, are, are just certain functions that have uh, unique properties. Uh, we're not, like I said, we're not going to go into the detail of what these properties are, but I will say that uh, the way elliptic curves are used is is by redefining the action of addition uh, as basically taking two points and uh, adding them to, uh, uh, to 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 get a third point. And that third point is is essentially uh, the result of uh, passing the line between the two original points, the two operands. And uh, the the third point that is uh, intersected by this line, uh, and then reflected over the axis will be the result of that addition. So again, not really important to know why we define addition like this, only that when you add two points, you get a third point. And since we can define addition, we can also define multiplication. So for example, if we add 
P uh, to P. Um, that's exactly the same as uh, as uh, as multiplying it by two. And of course, we can do that to basically any any scalar. Taking a look at BHRNG, we can see that um, it's implemented using the, the P256 elliptic curve, which is a standardized curve, meaning it's used commercially. Uh, it's, uh, it's an industry standard. Uh, and it has, our BHRNG mechanism has uh, several parameters. One is, the, one is the point P, which is just defined to be the curve generator point. That means that it's not a parameter that we defined, it's just something uh, that the elliptic curve P256 uh, defines. And there's an additional point Q, which just seems to be another point, completely arbitrary, not interesting at this point. Uh, in addition to that, the RNG has a state, uh, which is seeded by using Golang's vanilla RAND module, nothing special there. And the way the RNG works is by multiplying that state parameter, that state uh, uh, by P at every single uh, iteration, and then the output of the RNG will just be state masked by Q. And when I say masked, I just mean that we use Q, we multiply the state by Q in order to avoid revealing uh, state, since if we were to reveal the state uh, parameter of, uh, of our RNG uh, at any given point, um, we would basically be revealing all future values for that RNG. So once again, at every iteration of the RNG, every time we want to draw, draw random bytes from it, we first multiply state by P uh, and update that to be that the new state. And when and the output bytes will just be that state times Q. So some of you uh, who are more familiar with elliptic curve uh, uh, cryptography will have already recognized this as uh, an infamous uh, algorithm called UEC DRBG, which um, allegedly was uh, uh, was driven by certain government entities uh, to to commercial use because uh, it has a very significant flaw that allows it to be backdoored in a certain way. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to take a closer look at that in a moment. Firstly, I'd like to talk about how exactly, um, what exactly is so special about elliptic curves that allow us to use it as a cryptographical instrument. So, uh, the point of elliptic curves is that when you have a certain point G, you can com easily com multiply it by a scalar D to, uh, to receive a third point P. Um, but it's very hard to reverse this action. Once again, if you have G, then you can compute P, which is D times G very easily, but you cannot, it's very, very hard uh, or even impossible to compute D uh, just using those points P and G. Uh, in, in, in crypto, this is something that's often referred to as a trap door, uh, which is exactly the same as the trap door uh, used in Diffie-Hellman or RSA, uh, where in, in those, it's, the trap door is basically just um, the problem of, of solving discrete logarithms uh, over cyclic groups, and in elliptic curves, um, it's just computing that scalar D um, on an elliptic curve over a finite field. So again, going back to the UEC DRBG, um, we know that at every single iteration of the RNG, the point P is multiplied by a state, which is a scalar, and the resulting X coordinate, which is also a scalar, is multiplied by the point Q to, uh, to basically output some, some random bytes. In, in the case of our random number generator, BHRNG, uh, things are, even slightly simpler since uh, in, in dually CDRBG, some of the output bits are truncated, uh, albeit not enough. Um, but in the case of BHRNG, we just, uh, we see all of the value R, which is uh, defined as the output of the, of the random number generator, uh, which is again, just the multiplication of the current state by the point Q. So given a certain output from the random number generator, uh, we can say that we know that value R and we know Q, but due to the nature of, of, uh, of elliptic curves and, and the trapdoor function that we talked about, we cannot compute state. Uh, and again, it's very important to emphasize that if we did know state, we would be able to predict every single output from the RNG, every single future output. Um, and earlier, I very quickly glossed over the origin of that point Q, 
and that's for a very good reason, since that's really the key to how uh, this, uh, this algorithm may be backdoored. So let's do a little thought experiment. What if uh, that point Q was related to P in the sense that it was just the result, P was just the result of multiplying uh, Q by a certain scalar D that's known only to us. So again, going back to the, to, to the output of that RNG, at any single, at, at any given round, we know the output of the RNG, which is R, which is again state times Q, and we know that the next state of the RNG will be state times P. So if we know R, which is again state times Q, and we know D, then we can compute R times D, which is simply the state times Q times D, which computes to exactly the same as state times P. So once again, if we know the output of the, RN, of the RNG, single output, and we know that value D, we can compute the next state of the RNG, uh, which allows us to predict all the following outputs of it. So where would we go about discovering such a D? I mean, it can't be trivially computed, as we said, it has to be uh, known ahead of time. Um, and there's really no assurance that such a D is even known to anyone. Um, but in this case, there's probably, it's, it's pretty safe to assume that this is a, um, a direction that you'd want to explore. Um, and since we've basically uh, gone over the entire implementation of BHRNG, we can go back to square one and look at other parts of the uh, chat application. So back to the recon stage. Earlier, like I said, that the, the, the each peer basically establishes an, an encrypted tunnel with any other peer to relay messages on, but I also mentioned that peers are not really authenticated which means that if you were to open, let's say, TCP dump or Wireshark and look at the communications, um, they would be masked by, by, uh, by TLS uh, and you would have a very hard time decrypting it. Uh, but generally speaking, you do have access to the key. It is, is visible to you. Messages are basically in the circle of trust of, of anyone who's connected. Um, and that means that all the data going over that network is, is essentially plain text right up to the point of, of the application layer, which the application in this case is the interplanetary chat application. So we wouldn't be able to decrypt messages encrypted by the actual chat application, but all the information right up until that point should be completely uh, visible. Uh, and we have, I have a little snippet of, uh, uh, of, of, of the gossip sub code uh, in libp2p, which shows what happens when you receive a message that uh, you're not subscribed to from a topic you're not subscribed to. It just drops that message at a, an early point of the stack and it doesn't reach uh, uh, the actual chat application. But using a very small modification to the source code, we can try and just print out um, all the topics that we see. Um, so here you see the result of that modification where uh, two additional chat rooms are, are visible. Um, in, in real life, you might see more than just these two, but these are the ones that we wanted to attract attention to, and they are uh, aptly named. So looking at the, at the deep state's uh, chat room, uh, you see that there are several entities communicating between one another, but the messages between them are encrypted. This is just, the, the reason it says encrypted is just because the client is programmed such that any message that it does not hold open will just um, print out this uh, displace folder instead of the uh, just encrypted bytes. Um, so really not much to see in this chat room at this point, uh, but the other chat room uh, has some plain text messages, which seem to be very interesting since uh, what we see here are two distinct messages. Uh, one seems to be an RSA private key and the other one just seems to be some base64 buffer. Uh, and we can see that some parts of the RSA key have been uh, removed. Um, the second message does seem to be whole and the way I know this is because the, the last two bytes of the message are just uh, base64 padding. So uh, it's pretty safe to assume that we have the entirety of the second message, but the first message is partial. So um, an RSA private key is encoded using a format called PEM, uh, which in turn contains a binary encoding format called ASN1. Um, but in our case, that key has been both redacted and truncated. And what I mean by redacted is that bytes of the middle have been removed uh, and replaced, 
And by truncated, I mean that we don't have the entirety of the key, it was uh, cut at some point. Um, so what we can do is uh, pad the, the key, the partial key with, uh, um, let's say, you can just take the base64 payload and replace the redacted bytes with A's, which are nulls in base64, and, and pad it to the, to the appropriate uh, key length, and then try and uh, parse it using your ASM1 parser of choice. Um, and what you would see is that, indeed, um, we, we only have parts of the parameters that would be included in the RSA uh, private key. So the first integer is, if I recall, is just a, a version. It's not really important to anything. Um, the second one is the, is the value n, which is the modulus in, in the RSA crypto system. Um, the third one is e, the, the public exponent. Uh, which is again not a secret value. Uh, the fourth one is D, which is the private exponent, which if we had it, we would be able to decrypt messages. And as you can see, most of it is missing. Uh, and the final one that we see on, on the screen here is um, the one of the primes P or Q, uh, which also seems to be missing uh, some portion of its end, but there is a lot of material here. I mean, it's not completely truncated and it's missing a lot less data than let's say D. So again, without going into much detail about the RSA crypto system, um, what you need to know is that in order to decrypt the messages encrypted with this key, you would at the bare minimum need N, the modulus, and one of the primes P or Q. The rest you can uh, generate uh, by yourself. Uh, and we do have N and we have some approximation or part of the prime P. And this leads us to something called Coppersmith attack, which is a very common uh, attack utilized in, in, in these sort of uh, uh, CTF challenges. And what Coppersmith's attack says is that given uh, a modulus uh, where we don't know P or, Q, P or Q, but we do have some approximation of P um, bounded to some value, uh, then we can factorize N or, or more concretely, we can discover uh, the, the full value of P uh, in polynomial time, meaning it's achievable uh, very shortly. Um, and the way this works is by um, taking that polynomial, describing the difference between our partial P and the actual actual P, say X minus partial P, uh, create a lot of equivalent polynomials, meaning that they have the same solution, um, construct a matrix and use something called lattice reduction to reduce the basis of that space, uh, which ideally should result in a polynomial which can be factored or solved for x over the integers instead of over the integers uh, mod n, uh, which again just means that we will be able to do it in a short time, um, basically makes it feasible um, for, for anyone really. And um, luckily for us, again, we don't have to go into a lot of the theory here since uh, sage math, which is a uh, a uh, really great tool has all the primitives that we need to to uh, to solve this uh, this problem. It implements Coppersmith attack um, in the form of of uh, of the small roots function, which basically just finds a solution to that polynomial uh, x minus partial p. Um, and as you can see, the entire attack um, only takes maybe four or five uh, actual lines of code. Uh, and after we run it, we uh, have our P and Q, which uh, um, basically N and comprises. So we basically recovered the private the private key here, uh, which we can then uh, take back to our second message that we saw earlier and decrypt it to see the following uh, message. The government doesn't want you to know this number. And um, given what we've already seen earlier, uh, with regards to the elliptic curve, a uh, uh, random number generator, uh, it's pretty safe to assume that we're dealing with that uh, uh, secret value, backdoor value D. So once we know that, we can uh, basically uh, launch our full attack on this uh, chat application. Uh, since we have D and given, let's say, um, 16 bytes of data uh, of a previous um, uh, output of the RNG, we can predict its next state and thus predict all the future outputs of that RNG. And um, luckily for us, uh, we do have those bytes in the form of the IV, so the initialization vector, like 
we, we saw earlier that the IV is always generated right before the message key. So 16 bytes are, are output from, from the RNG for the IV and then for the message key. So what we can do, and you can see this in, in these uh, uh, code snippets here, is we can um, omit, completely comment out the, uh, the use of the actual um, master key or password, and instead we can use that value D um, and the IV for each, each message um, and plug them into this function called predict next bytes, which uh, what it does is basically just uh, generate a point from that, uh, from that observed byte value. Uh, and then compute the following states of the RNG by just multiplying it by D. And re recall earlier, I said that if you if you have the output of the RNG and you multiply it by that secret value D, you basically have the next state of the RNG. And if you have the next state of the RNG, you can multiply it by Q to get the next output of the RNG. So instead of using the master key, we just use the IV and predict the next uh, the next output of the RNG, which is, uh, of course, um, the message key, which should allow us to decrypt any single message going over going over the chat room. And indeed, when we run it, we can plug into the the chat room that we were not able to decrypt earlier, the deep state chat room. And you can see that there are those several entities uh, conversing that we saw earlier uh, are basically talking about a flag which they eventually um, uh, send in the chat room. Um, don't trust PRNGs and Blue Hat 2020. Uh, and that's essentially the solution to, to the challenge. Uh, you have to uh, do some recon to find uh, that secret value D and then utilize it to decrypt um, the, the secret messages going over the chat room. And of course, this would work for any encrypted chat room, not just this one specifically, um, since uh, in a sense, the, the, the encryption mechanism is, is backdoored due to our choice of PMQ. Um, and that is essentially it. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.